Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Comic-Con at Home. And uh, <laughs> don't, uh, yes, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Nobody rise. This panel is all about Beyond Court Martial, Space Law, Science Fiction, Science Fact. And boy, are we going to open your mind to maybe some um, aspects of real world space law that you hadn't thought about and even a new, uh, maybe a new filter, a new view on how you look at all your favorite franchises, depictions, uh, or lack thereof, <laughs> of law in space, law treaties and all of that. We've got a great panel going on here. I just want to get your mind rolling. You may be thinking about uh, space law. I mentioned Court Martial, the classic original series Star Trek episode. There are so many cases through Star Trek and through all the franchises. Um, we've got a beyond the legal shingle group here today with us, and you'll see why. Let me just introduce everybody. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about everything from individuals to, of course, treaties and that level so uh, get your mind in that mindset. And here in no particular order, except alphabetical, let me bring you our panel today, okay? Um, uh, Mike Gold is the Executive Vice President for Civil Space and External Affairs at Redwire Space, a company that is pushing the boundaries of innovation through satellites that construct themselves in orbit, building the largest solar arrays ever deployed in space and leveraging the microgravity environment to produce new revolutionary substances such as advanced fiber optics, crystals, and potentially even new medical treatments. But prior to joining Redwire, Mike worked at NASA as the Associate Administrator for Space Policy and Partnerships, where he led the creation adoption of the Artemis Accords. No, not the Kittimer Accords, that comes later. The Artemis Accords, which we'll talk more about. They established norms of behavior for civil space activities on the moon, comets, asteroids, and Mars. And they have now been signed by 11 nations. And he also led the execution of international agreements that establishes the Lunar Gateway, a cornerstone of the Artemis program. And I'm going to bomb Mike here a minute, as I will all our panelists after that, and say, Mike, what is your franchise geekiness of choice? Well, as is abundantly apparent from both the, <laughs> of the Artemis Accords and the hat, I am a Star Trek fan. All right, all right. We'll put a pin on that and move down our panel next. Teresa. Teresa Hitchens is the air and space reporter at Breaking Defense Magazine, where she covers air and space forces. Yes, we have them both now, as well as space related policy, regulatory, and legal issues. She just uh, completed an essay which is yet to be published. It's coming soon this fall, Into Boldly Go, I like that title, a collection of essays on how science fiction can inform strategic decision-making. And it's all about how the lack of legal structures surrounding corporate exploitation of space resources has inevitably led to conflict and violence in the, which universe, Teresa? The Expanse. <laughs> And I take it if I ask that question point blank, that is that your uh, franchise of choice now yeah, or what's currently, your? Currently, um, growing up, it was always Star Trek. Even after Star Wars, it was still Star Trek, but the expanse has captured my heart. Mm. Well, it's certainly closer to our situation right now. It's not quite so far flung, which is part of what we'll get into today, hopefully. Uh, kind of <laughs> near and far sci-fi. Um, next, we have... Jessica Noble, who serves as general counsel for Nanorax LLC, which is a leader in the commercial utilization of low earth orbit. She advises on a variety of topics, including transactions, corporate structure, and export controls. Now, before this, she advised on Capitol Hill on issues such as uh, issues related to space activities. And Jessica, uh, you had a heavy transactional corporate commercial angle there on space. So if I ask you what your geekness of choice is, I'm not going to be too surprised, I think. It would be? Well, uh, as you can see from my mm -hmm. friends that I have joining me here today, uh, Grogu and my loath cat Ezra, uh, it would have to be Star Wars. <laughs> oh, and you were wearing a... Oh, and uh, I am also representing Ahsoka Tano here today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you know, a lot of people critique some of the later movies for you know all they're doing, considering having trade conferences. But I see that's right down your alley. So anyway, uh, we, <laughs> we can get to that too. Uh, next up um, in our alphabet soup here, 
uh, border, uh, Daniel Porras, who is the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Communications at Secure World Foundation, which is a nonprofit that advises governments and industry on long-term sustainable uses of outer space. He's also a non-resident fellow at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research, where he focuses on the prevention of arms race in outer space. Uh, Daniel, what would I have to, uh, if I ask you about your franchise of choice, what would it be? Uh, there, there's no doubt. I, uh, I grew up a Star Wars fanatic um, from the very beginning. I think uh, Empire Strikes Back was one of the very first movies I saw in the, in the movie theater, and my dad and I grew up. Uh, playing the playing out the last scene between Darth Vader and, and Luke Skywalker from Return of the Jedi. So uh, that is my uh, my life model right there. OK, well, I just your quick resume there. I, it's, it's it's heartening to see that you're working for Star Peace instead of Star Wars. So we'll take that as a as a as a uh, as a plus <laughs> at the moment in the real world anyway. And last and certainly not least, uh, we've got Melinda Snodgrass on our panel. She is a self-described recovering lawyer <laughs> and failed opera singer turned writer screenwriter. You may best know her for her episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, The Measure of the Man, which is all about data and the rights of uh, non-organics, artificial life. Uh, she's written a lot, though, of original novels. And yes, she also has one original series book there, The Tears of the Singers. A lot of you may remember that. And she is co-editor and co-creator with George R.R. R. Martin of the Wild Cards book series. So, Melinda, after all that, do I get to ask you, um, and you have a, you have a, a new series of your own uh, creation coming. Uh, we're in the middle. You've done two or three books in the series. I, do. Um, I, I have to, this is treasonous, but my favorite geek franchise is Star Wars because Star Wars brought me to writing. Even though I was a Trek, you know, worked on the show, it was Star Wars that gave me the courage to quit the law firm and try writing. And uh, yeah, and I also love my own franchise, which is a big space opera. <laughs> so, um, which I hope to turn into a TV series because uh, I like to deal with things about economics and law and not just big space battles because ultimately they're boring. <laughs> so. You know, and even in Wild Cards with George, I'm trying to talk him into us doing how does the law work in a superhero universe? Because Wild Cards is a superhero universe. Hmm. Well, we're going to wind up. Uh, people don't come to Comic-Con for, you know, the law panels. But uh, <laughs> I know there's usually probably at least one every year and, and a lot of the larger conventions, too. So that when you open that, when you sort of say that can of worms, no offense intended, guys. When you go down that path, it becomes a lot more a, a multifaceted, you know, feature. We have the small law cases, and we have, you know, big law and treaties. So why don't why don't we start there? Let me just um, let me just throw this one out, and people jump in. Uh, we'll navigate. Um, uh, on the big end of law, we're talking about treaties. Uh, are, are we headed for a conflict in space? So much of our drama, our, we were talking near future, far-flung future, even in peaceful Star Trek, there's conflict, much less the one with the name in the title, Star Wars. Um, and even on a, I, I, we haven't mentioned For All Mankind, which I, I love, Ron Moore's alternate future history of the Russians beat us to the moon. And it's proceed, it's in near time too, it's alternate history, but I guess any future science fiction is alternate history that hasn't happened yet. For All Mankind is alternate history that has happened. Um, are, are, what's our view here? Are we, are we inevitably headed for war? Are we bound to replay what we've done terrestrially? Uh, I guess part of this depends on, is it just us in space or do we meet other beings in space? But anyone, anybody want to take a crack at that? There's a lot of current work being done, obviously, to prevent that. So I'm happy to jump in, Larry. And yeah. it's why I'm a Star Trek fan. And if I can stand up for Star Trek here, Star Trek articulates a future of peace, of cooperation, of diversity, of inclusion, and of progress. And as much as I like Star Wars, and I love Star Wars, and Daniel, I want you to know, I saw Empire Strikes Back with my grandmother. My father wasn't able to join us. I came back and spoiled to my father that Darth Vader, and spoilers for those of you who haven't seen Empire Strikes Back, I'm sure there's a lot, that uh, Darth Vader is Luke's father. And my father, until Jedi came out, denied it. He thought that Vader was, quote, just messing with him 
And it wasn't until much later we got that across. But, you know, Star Trek has always provided a vision of the future that, frankly, we'd want to live in. And, and this is where I diverge from Star Wars or Dune or even The Expanse. I don't think that's necessarily something to strive for. And I think in these challenging times, that need for an optimistic version of the future where we do get along with each other and even with other extraterrestrials, it's needed now more than ever, which is why I think Star Trek plays such an important role. It has played in the past. If you look at what Michelle Nichols did to recruit the first minority and female astronaut, Star Trek has a real impact on us here on Earth. So uh, Larry, I think we are potentially headed to conflict in space, which is why it's so important that we embrace that Star Trek vision and avoid it. You've mentioned that I led the effort on the Artemis Accords, which are a series of principles that we believe are simple, that are universal, and are intuitive to provide for peaceful exploration and development of the moon, Mars, comets, and asteroids. And if we can come together not only as a nation, but as a world to create these norms, to talk to each other about how we can peacefully move forward into space, then I believe we can avoid that conflict. So really determining what franchise the future emulates is up to us now. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us. I can say, I know you're fans of Star Wars or fans of The Expanse, et cetera, but please join me in saying that the future yeah. we want to live in is Star Trek. I Mike, uh, oh, uh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, just we'll do Dan then Teresa. Yeah. yeah, I'll gladly trade in my lightsaber if we can, uh, if we can ensure that we go along that, that Star Trek line. But you know, one of the things that has always fascinated me, especially about the all the franchises that we watch, is that we they are they're all great stories about people. At the end of the day, it's all about character development and and what we take with us in, when we go into to space exploration. So ultimately we're, we're just dealing with our own human nature, even as we have this gigantic, uh, this, new, this new sea of, uh, of possibilities. So uh, I think a lot of times the, really the stuff that attracts me more, more so than the, the sci-fi element, um, which of course is always there, but it's just the, the people story that comes behind it. Um, because regardless of where we end up, we're gonna act like people. And I just wanted to weigh in to say, we really need to throw away the word inevitable. Nothing is inevitable. And certainly human nature is not fixed. And it's one of the, I think, big mistakes that policymakers often make. They have a tendency to think that just because something happened in the past, it will happen that way in the future. And that's not necessarily true. People evolve, societies evolve humankind over many millennia has evolved in the way that they interact. And so I think when you say something like war is inevitable or there's always been war, there's always going to be war, I think that does all of us a disservice. I think it does society a disservice. And it is why if I had to choose where to live in the future, in a future franchise, it would be Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think The Expanse is a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale about what happens when you don't have proper norms, when governments have not taken uh, the responsibility to control corporate greed, for example. And all those things are tied up in that universe um, in a way that we ought to be looking at as a lesson in what not to do. Oh, go, Melissa. I mean, Melinda, yeah. Um, well, since we're talking so much about Star Trek, um, I'm going to tell you all that The Measure of a Man almost didn't get filmed as it was written because I, Gene and I had this, uh, this view where we disagreed fundamentally. Gene said there are no lawyers. In the we're talking Gene Roddenberry, of course, Roddenberry. just in case we've there got some really... No lawyers in the 24th century. And because there is no crime, because anybody who wants to commit a crime, we make their heads right which I found to be sort of a terrifying statement. And I also pointed, I was like, Mr. Roddenberry, this was as I just had started to work there. I said, that is crazy. Law is the foundation for civilization. I mean, you know, the, even, if, even if you assume you make everybody's mind right, God help us, there is the fact that there's child custody cases, there's divorces, there's inheritance. I mean, because I know they keep saying, well, there was no money and there's no property, but you know, if I have a harpsichord and I really want to leave it to my child, 
you know, I don't want it to go back into the transporter and become made into something new to come out of the wall. I want to give the trap harpsichord to my child. So presumably I have to have a lawyer to prepare my estate plan and treaties and you know, all of these other issues, the law is fundamental. And so this was sort of, I, you know, it was a baffling statement to me that there would be no law or no lawyers in the 24th century. Um, because like it or not, folks, we are here and you do need us. We, we have our uses. We really do. I, I, if I'd been a fly on the wall, I would have said, Gene, has that happened, changed in the last hundred years? Because we had a real Shaw. We had the Judge Advocate General's Office in Starfleet in Court Martial and in Menagerie and on it down was, the line. Yeah, it was, it I want to apologize to everybody for not having a little golden bell I could ding when we started the panel. I, I meant to, I looked, but I couldn't find one. How did it finally get, how, how did we finally uh, become blessed with the measure of the man? <laughs> Gene um, had a, a, was, he ended up not feeling well and he wasn't around and we shot it while he wasn't around at Paramount. <laughs> they rushed it in, they shot it and that's how it happened. So, um, yeah, uh, inside Star Trek stories, sorry. But I mean, I do think it's relevant in that, you know, to look at the, the foundational aspect of, of law in all of its forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, who was, somebody was jumping? Sorry. Oh, go, go, please, Jessica, <laughs> please go. Um, so yeah. also to, uh, to jump off of that idea of the foundational aspects of law and specifically space law and what we were talking mm -hmm. about, as far as conflict being inevitable when it comes to to our use of outer space and activities in outer space the thing that gives me the most hope and optimism is our foundational document for uh the use and activities in outer space the 1967 outer space mm -hmm. treaty because at a time in u.s history when we were on the brink of nuclear war, <laughs> looking into the abyss of, of global annihilation, these world leaders, the superpowers came together and said, we are going to leave this worst part of us here on earth. As we go out to explore the stars, we are going to leave nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction here and established that outer space would be free for use and exploration for peaceful purposes. I think that right there is one of the most amazing things about that document uh, for you know all its criticisms today as far as what it does or doesn't cover. Um, it is an incredibly optimistic document. Yeah, and to have been still when the, the, the space race to the moon was still very much a going thing. No one knew how it would come out and it was still very you know, nationalistic, competitive, and and people worried about throwing nukes into orbit, um, as in the Star Trek episode of Simon Earth. Uh, we just didn't have Gary Seven to come in and save us. But um, uh, that that's one thing. The found that that is it wasn't. There's a there's a, that's not the only space treaty though, right? From coming out of that time, right? I mean, on terrestrially, they had the Antarctic Treaty, which I always thought these kind of final frontier, one on the on the globe, and a couple more in space. Were, were a great, yeah, you're right. It's amazing that it came out of the Cold War at a time when there was so much competition. So- I, I just want to violently agree with Jessica, if I could, <laughs> that the outer space- <laughs> You're violently agreeing with my piece yeah, of purposes? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that, that's how, well, let me say enthusiastically to be a, a better term of art, but the Outer Space Treaty is literally the spine, the backbone of international space law. It's over 50 years old, doesn't look a day over 35. And there were a number of other treaties coming out of that period or close to it, the Registration Convention, the Agreement on the Rescue of Astronauts. What's going to be interesting as we look towards the future is these treaties have never been put to the test because we haven't yet had robust operations on the surface of the moon, for example, or on Mars. And our duty, our responsibility is to take these terrific words, these excellent treaties and implement them in a fashion that allows us to achieve the lofty objectives that they were set out to do. And again, that's what we're trying to do with the Artemis Accords and other ideas. Also in terms of launching nuclear missiles, I can't help but share a story that when I was with another company, Bigelow Aerospace, we contracted with Russia, well, a Russian company, Cosmotros, 
to take the SS-18, designated Satan by NATO. These were intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles. And we removed the warhead, put on commercial fairings, and used them for commercial space launch, and launched them from an active nuclear missile site in Russia. I actually literally had to warn the Pentagon that it was us launching, not World War III. But it was so amazing for me as a child of the Cold War to take these weapons of war and then as an adult turn them into tools for peaceful commerce, literally swords into plowshares, working with our former enemies and developing incredible relationships that really gave me hope that anything can happen. And like Jessica said, we need to leave our petty biases and bigotries here on earth so that we can do better in space than we have in the past. You were having a real Zephyrin Cochrane moment there and beforehand, taking an old Titan missile and using it for something um, peaceful and scientific. Literally reality imitating art. And while it was Russia, not Montana, I am from Montana. So. Oh, okay. Have you been to Bozeman? Uh, I have been to Bozeman many times. They're a bit of a rival. Uh, I'm from Billings, Montana. And when they showed Bozeman in the theaters in the first contact, we had to boo a little bit because it was Bozeman. Not Bozeman. <laughs> well, you know, and here's and here's my insider thing. You know, at the time of first contact, the movie that showed the whole Zephyr Cochran first experimental Warcraft plot, uh, it was just Resurrection City. It was just somewhere. And Brandon Braga co-wrote that with Ron Moore, the movie. And um as the years went by and they kept referring back to it in all the Star Trek episodes and series, it gradually it wasn't christened as Bozeman until later on. And that was one of the that was one of Brandon's hometowns. So it's like writers pulling you know stuff out of their background to throw at it. So because Brandon lived in Bozeman for a year or two when he was a kid, that's where first contact may happen or the big Zephyr Cochran statue is standing or whatever, whatever timeline we want to be in. But but this all this con this talk about conflict and war. Um, Yes, some people get off on that. But I guess a lot of that, just as it was terrestrially, the conflict comes in over uh, a competition, a lot of times, um, like for resources, right? For turf, for territory, and or indoor resources, even more than that. And it's uh, trying to get our, as we talk about what are we taking, you know, uh, what are our fears and, and human angst that we take in, or what are the weapons we take into space or don't? Part of that is the good old competition for um, for resources, and I'm again I'm watch I watch for all mankind, and they're mining lithium on the moon, and the Russians move in on the Americans' base there. And yes, this is a future history where where uh, technically the future didn't diverge until about the time of the moon landing. So the outer space treaty should have been in place. So I don't know what's I should have had Ron on the panel to grill him about this, but. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the loftiness of peace and war, pulling it back down to resources. I know some of you are working in that area. How are we avoiding um, finding those kind of more natural competitive instincts to compete and where friction might arise between, between you know, the nation states in these first decades of getting into space? This is actually where, again, the expanse is a cautionary tale because <laughs> right now we are not. Um, one of the, the lacunae in the Outer Space Treaty has to do with um, use of space resources. And the U.S. has some very particular opinions on that, on, on the legality of that, which are not universally shared, to put it mildly. Um, but what you, you have started to see is a number of spacefaring co countries gearing up to try to exploit space resource, resources mm -hmm. in a world where we don't really have any regulation or law or even really norms of behavior that are you know, um, firmly in place about how to act around those resources, about who has rights, who doesn't have rights. How do you share limited resources, for example? How do you ensure that your activities in space, whether that be mining or whether it simply be putting up a whole heck of a lot of satellites, these mega constellations, aren't getting in the way of other people's ability to use space in a way that the Outer Space Treaty says that all should be able to use space. So there is an inherent conflict there in the competition um, for resources with the overarching goals in some places of the Outer Space Treaty that we have yet to, as a global community, as a space-faring um, community, really come to grips with and really reach agreements on, even internally in the United States. There are arguments internally. Mm -hmm. As a lot of 
the folks who are really behind these big space companies or behind the push to to move out and to, to expand, if you will, into the solar system and beyond, um, come from a very libertarian kind of Silicon Valley, you know, mindset. And if you look, for example, at the kind of rules of engagement for Starship about uh, landing on the moon, and I can quote a little bit from that, if you give me two seconds. Um, this is the Starlink terms of agreement that were put together by Elon Musk's company, Space, uh, SpaceX, for services provided on Mars or in transit to Mars via Starship or other colonization spacecraft. The parties recognize Mars as a free planet and that no Earth-based government has authority or sovereignty over Martian activities. Accordingly, disputes will be settled through self-governing principles established in good faith at the time of the Martian settlement, unquote. And if you really think about that, does that say that Elon Musk gets to make the rules on Mars? Is that what it says? At the, or the people that he's handpicked to come on the first trip to go? And that's a very disturbing question, if you think about it, um, in the long term. So we're at the beginning of this kind of um, real- Sounds very, it's very Mayflower compacty. I mean, as far as- or East India Tea Company, which is even scarier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't and know. Good luck finding a court that's going to enforce that contractual provision, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'll actually let Mike speak to the the Artemis Accords because I think this is probably a, a good place to plug that. But um, you know, it's not just lunar stuff that that is um, a limited resource. You know, I know a lot of people when they think about space mining and you know mining comets we think that it's going to be abundant and that there will be more than enough for everyone. Well, yes, but also it's really hard and expensive to get to any of that. And, it's, and we're probably still a few decades away. Um, but there is at least one resource that is fairly limited that we're using up um, at an increasingly uh, rapid rate. And that is uh, our low earth orbits. I mean, just the ability to put things up in space. Um, if you have an object in space, you can't have another object occupying the exact same um, space. So um, one of the things that we're starting to grapple with now is how are we going to be, uh, how are we going to share that limited area that, you know, um, that global commons. Uh, and so I think really at the end of the day, the, the more a lot of experts look at this, it's just a question of getting organized. We need to be a little bit more efficient in, uh, in the way that we're using things and to talk to one another and say, hey, um, if we're going to be doing activities in outer space, let's at least have a couple of ground rules that say, like, this is where you should go, this is where you shouldn't go, you can get this close to me, don't get that close to me, um, and certainly don't point any missiles at my stuff. Um, <laughs> that's never appreciated either. Um, but but fairly simple things, and I think as long as we we communicate with one another, um, the the tasks that we're, we're faced with in outer space are so massive. Uh, I cannot imagine that it won't involve a lot of cooperation and that as we venture out into, into some of these space activities, I'm sure we're going to have to come together whether we like it or not. But yeah. Mike, you, you can certainly speak to the lunar aspects of that. Well, I, I owe you a bottle of Romulan ale, Daniel, for each plug of the Artemis Accords. I appreciate it. And again, the Accords were written to prevent exactly that kind of conflict, that we've got safety zones where countries will inform the United Nations where they're operating, how they're operating, to implement the Outer Space Treaty's prevention of harmful interference, whether that's intentional in terms of pointing a gun or unintentional that you just roll over uh, uh, operations or somehow interfere. And in terms of resources, the Accords state that all countries can only operate within the boundaries of the Outer Space Treaty, so all activities should be conducted under those auspices, and that you can extract resources and it should be done in a safe and sustainable manner. But I, I wanna get back to something that both you and Teresa hit upon, which is low Earth orbit and the incredibly dangerous situation we have there now. Actually, normally I think science fiction has a very positive impact on space policy discourse, this is one place, space resources, where I think it's actually negative that we get far too caught up in Avatar in the expanse. And there's this idea that there's this wealth of resources that will mine and be able to generate revenue. I would love as a commercial space person to think that that's 
possible, but I think that's extraordinarily far away and will only occur when we've got a developed space industry. What we're going to see, I think, in the relative near term is extraction of resources for scientific use, to act as in situ resource utilization for government exploration. And I think we actually spend far too much time talking about that issue versus something that's more of a clear and present danger, which is the situation in low Earth orbit. It used to be that we launch one rocket and you deploy one satellite. Now in the last SpaceX transport mission, what we had over 170 spacecraft deployed at once. And this is going to be occurring on a regular basis. Say nothing of the thousands of spacecraft that are occurring with the mega constellations. When I was at NASA, I helped negotiate the agreement with SpaceX relative to Starlink and keeping NASA hardware safe. But I can tell you, this is the existential crisis of our times. And it is upon us that it's, it, we talk about things not being inevitable. If we don't take action, a crisis in orbit, a conjunction, which is just a fancy way of saying an accident, that is inevitable statistically, mathematically. And we've got to leverage our political and diplomatic muscles as well as innovative technology like at Redwire, we have satellites that can build themselves and roll out solar arrays and new means of propulsion and robotics that can keep the environment safe and preserve it. We as lawyers really are in the driver's seat here that I tell the engineers, they've got the easy part. I mean, there's no rocket equation for Congress or for determining liability. You know, math is easy, you know, getting global agreements is hard. And that's why it's so important for space lawyers and space policy experts to create liability, to create rules that will prevent a conjunction happening that could remove space for all of us. And our entire modern society depends on space technology. I hope that we can have a wake up call and spend a lot more time on that issue rather than space resources, which is absolutely important, but I believe is less of a threat to our daily lives than the issues that you described in low earth orbit. I actually have a little bit, I mean, <laughs> I'm sitting here, I use Starlink <laughs> because I'm out in the boonies and the only way I can communicate it with any regularity is using Starlink. Um, however, the other thing that I was listening to all of you talk and, and I'm you know, sort of the fantasist here, I'm not actually working at this except in my books and teleplays, but- Do you have your shingle? Thing, let's, make sh okay. let's make sure everybody, oh, yes, okay. okay but you know, in terms of, I mean, I'm sitting here listening to this in spacefaring nations and will they be able to utilize the resources? That's great, but the handful of nations that actually are spacefaring nations, how do you regulate in some way that shares that wealth, especially if we're talking about limited resources like lithium, which is in fact, you know, only created, I believe, at the creation at the moment of the Big Bang. You know, we're not sort of finding a lot of it. Um, and is it helium or hydrogen three that the Chinese are very interested in um, at the South Pole of the Moon as, a, as an energy source? I mean, there are so many things. And how do you say to other countries, other not as main as well developed as as, uh, as as Russia or China or Japan or us, that how do we share that wealth? Is that something that needs to be looked at and discussed as well? You've, you've struck actually on one of the big conversations that's currently being had at the UN level. In fact, if the discussions that I'm hearing out of the UN Legal Subcommittee on the Committee of the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space are, are accurate, I think by, we by Wednesday, we should be having a working group that will actually be discussing these, these very things. Um, but you know, one of the reasons why we're really delighted to have this panel is we've thought about some of this stuff. Like We're not going into, the, into those discussions with a, a totally fresh look, um, especially through a lot of sci-fi. We, we've kind of had an opportunity to have these, um, you know, just to imagine, okay, what's the best case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? What happens if we do this? And what happens if we do that? And, and I think a lot of writers over the years have contributed some fascinating visions of what lunar colonies are going to look like, what, you know, uh, interplanetary society is going to look like. Um, you know, again, the expanse is a really great example right now of what can happen if we don't, you know, keep, keep some self-awareness about us. Um, but it's, it's happening. It, it's happening right now as we speak. And, and that's what makes it so exciting. Sci-fi on the verge oh, of becoming sci-fact. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Happy to join but, in. 
that's what I was going to say was you all are all full of the impetus here. You've done, you've been doing the work and all that. And that's interesting to hear about the, where the UN committee is, but what about the public at large, the, our consciousness? There's, it's not like there's a lack of things to grab people's attention right now, current events, uh, political, medical, scientific and all that. Um, but this is around the corner. It's one of the, it almost feels like unless you're, you know, a space nerd or a science fiction nerd, or this is your industry, your engineer, your, 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 career is is in that field but for the average lay audience keeping up with all the news this feels like it's so much under the radar until something you know may flare up to where it's not and suddenly we're wondering that and what's what's going on to bring that to more of a public consciousness and compete for attention for all these things that we we agree are are um you know not as much as, as not only to be done but in how we as citizens and as Melinda was saying, you know, like we've got the th- we've got the situation with the vaccine rollout where we've got the haves and the have nots. So what do we do about is anybody going to speak up for for the non space fairs, even as the space fairs are wrangling all this? But as, as far as just keeping it as a public consciousness topic and, and pushing this along, because, again, I think under the radar, a lot of this technology is developing. We've had, you know, the the. Um, the entrepreneur space world has come along so much in the last five, 10 years. Governments, everything is in a juggle, it's in a flux, and a lot of it's to be celebrated. But how do we get ahead of these problems, say, like in the expanse that um, we can avoid on the get go? So, Larry, from, from, from the, from, as a groundswell, is what I'm trying to say. Larry, we talk about sharing of resources, but I think it's even more important, particularly in terms of near term issues to look at the sharing of information. That one of the founding principles, again, of the Artemis Accords is the full, free, timely, and public release of scientific data. What I love about the Artemis program, which for those who don't know, is NASA's effort to return to the moon to prepare for a human mission to Mars, is that if you've got an internet connection, if you've got Starlink, like Melinda in New Mexico, or if you're in a location anywhere on Earth, if you can access the internet, you can enjoy the benefits and the science, the awe and wonder of the Artemis program. And before we get to resources, it's so important that we begin by laying a foundation of sharing information and data so that the whole world can come with us on this journey. And my hope is that the Artemis Accords, even for countries that aren't participating in Artemis, adopt this. And if we can begin by sharing information, we'll have laid a foundation that not only keeps all space activities in people's minds, but have created a paradigm that will create a peaceful future. And then one other issue is planetary protection that you talk about the virus. Well, the last thing we wanna do is bring back a virus from outer space. Mm or to somehow contaminate the moon or Mars that would prevent scientific commercial activity. And that's why it's very important too that we be transparent, another principle of the Artemis Accords, as to what we're doing in space. And not all countries are abiding by those principles. So it's important for the US and partner nations to lead by example so that we're transparent, we share the information, we share the awe and the wonder, and protect the environment in space. Well, let me, a real quick clarification. We're talking about Project Artemis, which is NASA's program to get back to Mars. And that is or isn't really related to the Artemis Accords. Right, so the Artemis program is to land uh, the first woman, first person of color and return astronauts to the surface of the moon, as well as deploy infrastructure, such as the gateway, which will be an orbital outpost around the moon. And that's all in preparation to launch a historic crewed mission to Mars. The Artemis Accords, you can think of as are the price of admission, that if you're going to join us on this journey, NASA and the other international partners that are working on this program are saying, you have to abide by certain principles because it's not only important to send our astronauts, but we need to send our values of peace, of science, of openness, of transparency, and take those values along with our treaties, the Outer Space Treaty, the Registration Convention, with us to the moon and Mars, that we not just have better technology, but have a better future in space. So the Artemis Accords were not a standalone successor treaty, proposed treaty to the Outer Space Treaty. 
Yeah. It's an outgrowth of the American Artemis uh, program, but yeah. as an outgrowth, as an outreach to the rest of the world to say, yeah. here's what. Right. We're not we're not making this a nationalistic program. They're, we're trying not, to make it. They are not an international treaty. They are not a, a treaty. They are a set of voluntary principles that the United States came up with on its own to govern its activities in going to the moon and Mars. And I think, as Mike even said before, there are many countries who are not necessarily down with the same value sets or have the same approach. Many countries who are not spacefaring or who are emerging um, as spacefaring countries, let's look at say India or Brazil, maybe South Africa, there are some, uh, many countries are very, very skeptical, not just of the Artemis Accords, but of um, US uh, industry efforts to, to you know, um, have a boom in space activities because they're afraid they're gonna be left behind and they have reasons for having that fear. I mean, if you look at, as I said, the East India Company or colonization or any of those things, you know, those things are stuck in, in the minds of many around the world, many underdeveloped, lesser developed countries. And that's a, a key problem and it's a difficulty that we're gonna have to get over. I, I also wanted to make a point about information sharing because I think that is really critical. Um, but we also have to understand that there are um, barriers to information sharing. And one of them is the increasing militarization of, of space, of space activities. And as militaries become more involved in um, using space for tactical purposes, for national security purposes, the tendencies are to become less willing to share information. The tendencies are to not necessarily tell the whole truth about what's happening in space. The tendencies are to think of people you are probably supposed to be cooperating with as potential enemies. And that mindset, that military mindset is something that, you, that we have to be very careful of as we go forward because if you view space only through the eyeballs of the military and the military's perspective, you will have lost the battle for space in the future. So I, I do have to take quick issue with something Teresa said that the Artemis Accords were not developed unilaterally by the United States. They were negotiated with eight countries and not only eight space agencies, but eight different ministries of foreign affairs. If I were to take the Star Trek hat off, you would see the gray hair that that caused because that kind of multilateral negotiation is extraordinarily difficult. There's another treaty we haven't talked about, which is the Moon Agreement, which is the agreement that actually has a sharing regime. And not only did we have to accommodate the position of countries that were more leaning forward on space resources, and Teresa's like, right, the United States, Luxembourg, United Arab Emirates, but also a Moon Agreement signatory in Australia. So the Artemis Accords represented common ground between countries like the United States that oppose the Moon Agreement and countries like Australia that actually endorse it. Now, anytime, believe me, you've got a treaty or anything in space, particularly when it was in fact US led, there's going to be controversy. But again, we did our best with the Accords to ensure that they implemented the Outer Space Treaty. Frankly, every country that is signed the Outer Space Treaty already is on board with probably 90% of what's in the Accords. And you mentioned Brazil. Brazil has indicated that they will sign the accords in a uh, agreement of intent with NASA. Uh, so I think stay tuned on that. And whether it's the accords or anything else, we're hoping that it's the beginning of a conversation, not an ending. And that there may be countries with different views, but what's important is that we all adopt principles to ensure peace and safety and that we have that dialogue now before conflict occurs. And that, more than anything, is the purpose of the Accords. Next time I have to brief the UN, I'm going to start out by saying, let's go the Star Trek route, not the Star Wars route. <laughs> you, wait, you, you haven't been already? <laughs> I, I, so I, try, I was trying not to play up into the stereotypes. I, I, would, I would like to remind folks, so that in the prequels, that Star Wars, the, the system of govern, governance, was a democratically elected legislative body. And that's where, um, you know, just my, my plug here for, for Star Wars as a, more of a cautionary tale. I mean, yeah. not 
not just saying like, don't go the Star Wars route, but as a cautionary tale of what can happen when you don't put uh, safeguards in to your, your legislative bodies to protect for abuse of power. I'll, I'll be honest, like when I have students, I, I also don't teach them or I, I try to tell them, like, don't go the way of Anakin Skywalker. Watch Padme Amidala, like <laughs> Natalie Portman's character. That's the one that you want to emulate. That's the one you want Natalie to Portman, Padme Amidala would have been in support of the, the Artemis Accords. I will go on record. I will say it here. She would have. <laughs> Mike, you can quote her on that. Bold, bold <laughs> statement there. Let me, let me, let me, uh, and, and Brazil, that's the signing I'm most excited about. Thank you, Jessica. You're welcome. <laughs> there you go. Um, and we say this is uh, space law, sci-fi versus real world law. And I, we're still in these, in these, it's kind of where our space development is. Someone mentioned that we're, you know, we're, we are where, where our technology and our development is. And a lot of, um, what uh, some people, when they think about sci-fi law cases, we think about courtrooms and hearings and the Perry Mason end of it or the space jag end of it. Um, and like, like the measure of a man and the whole thing about data's rights as an individual, uh, you know, be, not being an organic, being artificial intelligence. And that's very, very fertile fodder these days <laughs> uh, for, you know, robot Hal was maybe one of the originals and there's I know there literature has plenty before that but as far as the whole we've been talking on this big scope of governments and nationalities and bridging the gap and resources but law is also you know about individuals um I don't know if we have enough time to get into this but maybe just bear some mind toward that because one thing I do want to do as we get down to the end here is have everybody in your favorite in your not favorite whatever is talk about either a best case of law you know, from the treaty end down to the individual, um, the best case of law that you've enjoyed in some dramatization of sci-fi or the worst case, <laughs> like the thing that made you grit your teeth and you, and you know exactly why. Anybody want to take a shot at that before we totally run out of time? Just... Hey, actually. Oh, go go ahead. ahead. No, 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 please, please. I was just going to say um, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, which I love that movie, but it made me nuts when they arrested the Guardians and and uh, and they all went, oh, okay, we've arrested you, now you're in prison. And I was sitting there going, are there no lawyers? Do you not have a defense attorney? Was there not an arraignment? Was there a trial before you sent these people to this horrible prison? So that moment where I went, okay, the, the escape is exciting, but I wanted, what, what happened before they sent them to prison? And this was supposed to be a great culture. And I was like, not a great culture if they can just send you right to prison after they arrest you. So that's my bad example. <laughs> I was going to say the frame there would tell you all. And yeah, it, it doesn't sync up. Any, anybody else want to? I'll, I'll actually throw a slightly realistic um, uh, example. Uh, the Barack Obama White House issued an official statement because enough people had been writing about uh, building a Death Star. And the, uh, the Obama administration uh, issued a statement saying, we've reviewed the Outer Space Treaty and found that a Death Star would definitely qualify as a weapon of mass destruction. And under Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty, you cannot put weapons of mass destruction in orbit. Uh, so apart from the fact that it would be impossibly expensive to build, uh, we don't see that this would be uh, in accordance with our international obligations. You know what? Thank you for clarifying that. We, I'm glad we put it to rest. <laughs> At least not in the near term, right? While the treaty is still. Is there a, is there a, is there an in, in, is that a treaty with a, it's from 1967. Is There's not an end date, right? Or a sunset no. law provision to it. It's just. No. no. Okay. It's, it, it's sufficiently <laughs> vague. It's sufficiently vague that it just continues to perpetuate. I love the Outer Space Treaty and why it's lasted so long. It's a treaty of principles. It's not prescriptive. It doesn't tell you exactly how to achieve the objectives, just that the objectives need to be achieved. And again, those are universal in terms of preventing conflict, preventing weapons of mass destruction. So I think that's why it's lasted so long. And we actually stole that structure from the Ardent Sports for the same reason. But to answer your question real quick, I want to play to the audience and say Measure of Man was my favorite courtroom show and a highlight in what was otherwise a dismal first two seasons for Star Trek The Next Generation. And Linda, thank you for giving us that bright light there. Um, and and fighting the fight now that we've heard, yes. Absolutely, I, I mean, that was Gene Roddenberry. We can talk about when creators get in too much control, whether it's 
Lucas on the prequels or Roddenberry in the first couple of seasons or Star Trek, the slow motion picture, um, you know, that, that can go badly. Uh, and I actually like Star Trek motion picture a little bit. But um, I want to say where I got most angry about space law was in the National Geographic series Mars, if anyone's seen that, where you had the scientists and the commercial entrepreneurs in a fight. And that's exactly what we were working to prevent, that they had commercial companies that were coming into an area that they didn't want to spoil by commercial activity and the scientists were getting mad. When I was at NASA, we worked on something called Coast Bar Reform, where we were trying to ensure that everyone benefits, that when we explore the private sector benefits, the more private sector activity, the better science is going to be. The more human exploration, the better science is going to be. The more human exploration, the more commercial activity is. We're stronger when we all work together. And as I was literally working well into the night to try and craft the ways for science and for commercial and human space flight to work together, to then turn on the television and see, oh, here's the battle. Well, again, it's a cautionary tale. That's exactly what we're trying to stop. And I think we've now got a good basis for that. Yeah. Anybody else have a uh, have a teeth grinder of a situation you've seen depicted? Just. It, it wasn't so much a, a teeth grinder, more like an eye roll, but uh, in the Martian, um, uh, at one point when uh, when Matt Damon's character uh, had to use an older piece of equipment to be able to uh, to travel to the destination to to get himself off of Mars, uh, he went into this monologue describing international law and piracy and how he was now a space pirate for having uh, taken over this uh, this vehicle which uh, I mean, I, I love for the hilarity of the situation, but it completely uh, ignores the doctrine of necessity. Uh, and so for me, it was, uh, it was just a giant eye roll, but that's <laughs> my thought. <laughs> oh, everybody, this has been so much fun. Uh, we've just cracked the surface here. We just barely cracked. Um, there's so many as other aspects to law, but at least Hopefully we have opened a lot of folks' eyes to, uh, to not only the potentials of law applications on a large scale and an individual scale, but also what's happening right now and where we are, what we've accomplished and what we've got so, so much more to do. So thank you all for being here today. I totally neglected to introduce myself at the beginning. I'm Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek. <laughs> uh, many of you know as the author of The Next Generation Companion, also right now host of The Trek Files on the Roddenberry Network. Uh, live, uh, live support live on Saturdays and uh, Trekland Tuesdays live on Tuesday and uh, author also of Stellar Cartography from Star Trek. So thank you for joining us. Thanks to this wonderful panel here today. Hopefully we all got a little uh, elucidated and a little more activist in what we know we need to do to bring the future that we all say we want rather than the one we all enjoy watching dramatized. <laughs> so thanks everybody. And I'll go down the line real quick. What's your one best way if people want to follow you or find you? Mike, let's start with you. Uh, you can follow uh, the more than five year journey, the ongoing journey of Redwire Space at, uh, at Redwire Space on Twitter. Uh, Melinda. Did we lose her? Did we lose her? Go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> I just want to add, she was on a Starlink uh, connection. <laughs> uh, you can reach me at... Um, dporus at swfound.org um, that's publicly available information and you can also follow me on twitter uh, i am at space da porus p-o-r-r-a-s very good uh i'll work my way back teresa i'm probably easiest to catch on my work email which is t hitchens at breakingdefense.com very good and uh, jessica well, you can find me on Twitter at, at jsweens. <laughs> but uh, I'm mostly reposting things from uh, from my company, Nanorax. You can also catch up on uh, what what we're doing, commercial space, and exciting projects like the airlock uh, or the Bishop Airlock, the newest addition to the International Space Station. You can, uh, follow them at uh, at Nanorax and our sister educational company at uh, DreamUp. 
Awesome, awesome. And Melinda, we have you back. What's I'm what's so it? Yeah, Starling failed me, so I'm trying DSL <laughs> to see if it's more stable. Um, uh, I have a website. Um, I'm probably the only Melinda Snodgrass in the wild, so I'm not hard to find. And I'm very active on Facebook and Twitter. So come and say hi. Um, talk about writing. Talk about law. Are about horses and dressage, or opera, whatever, whatever you like. <laughs> Awesome. And I'm Larry Nimichek at uh, at Larry Nimichek on Twitter and YouTube. Please like and subscribe. Uh, also, LarryNimichek.com for everything Trekland, including Portal 47 and our Trekland Treks and Geek Nation tours, uh, film location tours and all the stuff is there. Uh, gang, thanks again for for joining us on this panel today. And thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, trek well, everybody. <laughs>